Good afternoon and welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from the Frontier. Thank you as always for stopping by. Let me start with obviously what's the biggest story in the markets, which is the oil market. Brent crude ended 14.6% higher yesterday at $69.02. It's currently at $67.78. And uh, WTI rallied 14.8% to close at $62.90, and uh, we're currently at $62. Um, There's still no real official word from Aramco, nor the Saudi oil ministry, two days after the first update on Saturday night. Brent futures, which soared $11.73 a barrel in intraday trading. This was the biggest increase since the contract was launched in 1988. Um, And, uh, you know, I've written about it and I'll come back to what I wrote. But essentially, yesterday, as I thought about it, um, I think Brent crude is a monster buy on any retracement now. Um, particularly further out, 2020, for example, we've seen an interesting development. Near-term oil has been squeezed a lot higher, but actually the world is awash in oil right now. It's further out that I think things will play out in a more interesting manner. And I think we're at the same point we were at in 1978-1979 in Iran, Um, where the once fabulous peacock throne of Shah Reza Pahlavi, uh, who spent his final days looking out to sea in Panama. And I think we're at that risk. The risk is not unlike uh, that moment in Iran all those years ago. And the getaway is the serene, the yacht the Crown Prince bought for $500 million. The question that has been raised now, in my opinion, is around the longevity of the House of Saud and its Crown Prince, who, according to Robert Baer, has so many enemies that he sleeps on his $500 million yacht, the Serene of Jeddah. The overwhelming geopolitical question is therefore around the longevity of the House of Saud. Um, and uh, I think this will increase the upside pressure on the oil price uh, further out. Uh, I like this from David Inglis, pump up the volume, showing a surge in futures contracts. Um, and so I'll come back to the story, but a really dynamic uh, uh, disjunctive move higher was witnessed yesterday. On this day in history, 1992, yesterday actually, George Soros' quantum fund broke the Bank of England. That was from FX Macro. Um, Of course, it was George Soros, and I wrote about this at the beginning of August, um, and his subsequent partner, Stanley Druckenmiller, who forced the pound sterling out of the exchange rate mechanism on Black Wednesday, 16th September 1992. I recall that day in slow motion and as if it were a newsreel. I was then on the trading floor at Claire Credit Suisse First Boston and next to me was the prop trading desk. I was on the repo desk and the speed of thought and execution that I witnessed that day, I never witnessed again, ever. And therefore, as I watched the pound fall like a stone, and this is written when we fell below 121, I could not help wondering if the sterling moment we're in now is precisely like it was in 1992 and not no-brainer. This is a live chart of the pound versus the dollar. We're currently at 124.20. There was a lot of drama yesterday with Boris, but essentially my view remains Um, whether he's doing it by subterfuge, but I think the UK is leaving as he's already previously pronounced several times. Home thoughts, a flight landing in Munich just after sunrise with beautiful swirls, the result of the 
plane's wingtip vortices. This is a 2015 photo by Timo Harsh via Rainmaker 1973. For some reason, I went back to that comment of Emperor Babur, who says, many have spoken over this spring, <clears throat> but they were gone in the twinkling of an eye. We conquered the world with bravery and might, but we did not take it with us to the grave, which is life. And then I went to time changes and our desires change. What we believe, even what we are, is ever changing. The world is change, which forever takes on new qualities. One of the most interesting and disturbing aspects of Trump's psyche is his envy. Envy arises when we feel we aren't getting the recognition we deserve. It's based in fear of a threat to our social position. This is Asherangapa. And that took me to this quote in Othello. Oh, beware, my lord, of jealousy. It is the green-eyed monster which doth mock the meat it feeds on. To wit, Asher says, Iago was envious. Othello was jealous. And she's saying, which is Trump. Political Reflections Israel heads into Tuesday's election as a fiercely divided nation with no definitive sign whether Prime Minister Netanyahu will retain his grip on power. Knife edge election, let's see what happens. China, uh, whilst fending off Trump in a flare up on its periphery, will mark the 70th anniversary of the People's Republic on October the 1st. What does an underground nuclear blast look like? This 1962 footage gives you an idea. A cratering explosion, a yield of 104 kilotons, releasing seismic energy equivalent to 4.75 on the Richter scale. As I wrote before, the frontier from Xinjiang to Kashmir, from Kashmir is completely locked down still. Xinjiang is a dystopian uh, panopticum. Gaza, well, that's been a dystopian panopticum for a long time. Crimea, Hong Kong, Taiwan are all 21st century flashpoints. And uh, we learned that uh, the end of our relations with the Solomon Islands reflects China's unceasing efforts to lure away our allies, damage the morale of the Taiwanese people, and force us to accept one country, two systems. To this, the people of Taiwan say, not a chance. That's the president of Taiwan. Perfect quote for multiple world leaders today. The man who is always waving the flag usually waves what it stands for. Lawrence J. Peter, which took me to the second coming, turning and turning, and the widening giant falcon cannot hear the falconer, things fall apart, the center cannot hold, mere anarchy is loosed upon the world, the blood dimmed tide is loosed and everywhere, the ceremony of innocence is drowned, the best lack all conviction while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming. Hardly are those words out when a vast image out of spiritus mundi troubles my sight, a waste of desert sand, a shape with lion body and the head of a man. A gaze blank and pitiless as the sun is moving its slow thighs while all about it wind shadows of the indignant desert birds. The darkness drops again, but now I know that twenty centuries of stony sleep were vexed a nightmare by a rocking cradle, and what rough beast its hour come round at last slouches towards Bethlehem.
to be born. And on that point, in April I said there is certainly a fin de siècle, even apocalyptic mood afoot. The conundrum for those who wish to bet on the end of the world is this, however, what would be the point? The world would have ended. On the 19th of August, I said safe havens are priced for Armageddon now. And indeed they were, you can't go much further than that, and we, we saw that retracement. Salman Rushdie, we live in a moment in which truth is stranger than fiction, and so fiction has to decide how strange it needs to be in order to get close to the truth. And then one of my favourite quotes of his, ours is the most cryptic of centuries. It's true nature, a dark secret. Putin uh, trolls uh, the Saudis, offers to sell Saudi Arabia one of Russia's S-400 anti-aircraft systems to defend its oil facilities. I like this from Birdie Word, who's a terrible, who's a great wag. The year is 2058. U.S. unemployment edges up to 0.14% in July, prompting expectations that the paddle bot may reduce the e-dollar fund, Fed funds rate to negative 13%. Crown Prince MBS IV considers listing Aramco, the world's biggest solar energy company, on the Ho Chi Minh City Exchange. International markets, I take you back to the 24th of June. I said the point when the curtain was lifted in the Wizard of Oz and the wizard revealed to be an ordinary conman from Omaha who has been using elaborate magic tricks and props to make himself seem great and powerful should not lull us into a false sense of security. This is voodoo economics, and just because we have not reached that point when the curtain was lifted in the Wizard of Oz, should not lull us into a false sense of security. There has been chaos in the repo market. I ran repo desks, um, so this is really chaotic signals. Fed may be losing control of rates. Monday's jump in overnight repo rates, especially since it's not happening at the end of a quarter, is bordering on chaos. First of July, I said in the US at that time the market had priced in a halving of the Fed funds rate from 25 to 1.25% over 12 months. And I was saying if I were back at the trading desk, I would have been limit short the euro dollar market as from that Monday. You might not know, but I was a short-end trader in my previous career in the City of London, and I made my first reputation-making trade at Credit Suisse Plus Boston all those years ago in the Euro-dollar market. And if I, were, if I were back at that desk, I would be limit short in the Euro-dollar market. And I said then, reality will soon intrude on this reality show. Fed expectations getting repriced, 34% now say we may be on hold tomorrow. Expectations suddenly are rising that the Fed might not cut interest rates this week. Um, at that point, which that tweet was earlier from Holger, there was a 6% probability of the Fed staying put. General collateral repo traded at 4.75%. Anyone that follows this market knows just how batshit crazy that is. A 200 basis point intraday range. The dollar funding storm has officially arrived. Good luck to those still short dollars. Inflation break evens are jumping it's alongside oil. That's from Tracy Alloway. Which takes me back to something I said at the end of last year. I said the direction of the dollar is therefore pivotal. Dollar index, have a look at this. Beware of the next Fed speech on Wednesday. Chart suggests a rise till February, March 2020. Midterm adjustment sentence still in place. Currently, we're at around 98.647. We topped 99 twice. I think the third time we're going to burst through it. And as I said at the end of December, I'm increasingly in the minority, but I expect the dollar to strengthen about 10% in 2019. 
This is a dollar index chart from Adam Mancini, who says, once again, the recent sell-off in the dollar was bought and we appear to be forming a solid bull flag since the month started. If this breaks up, it's likely we set yet another high to 100 this time. And I take you back to the 5th of August when I said I find it curious that such a stable genius has yet to calculate that a strong dollar is infinitely better and that if he is serious about his warfare strategy, he needs to add currency warfare to his tariff, sanction and linguistic warfare arsenal. Trump keeps talking about weakening the dollar um, and as I said, yet to calculate that a strong dollar is infinitely better. My perspective, this was in August, the beginning of August, my perspective about the dollar is this. Um, there is very little President Trump can do. In fact, the risk is that when the market sees he is powerless, the dollar might lift off like the proverbial parabola. The parabola, of course, it is a curve. Each of them feels unmistakably it is the parabola. They must have guessed once or twice, guessed and refused to believe that everything always collectively had been moving toward that purified shape, latent in the sky, that shape of no surprise, no second chance, no return. Currency markets, euro dollar 110.05, dollar index is, uh, as I said, just below 99, Japanese yen 108.20, Swissy 0.9919, the pound all over the place, 124.08. I believe we're going back below 120 at some point ahead of October. Uh, Australian dollar, let's have a look at that, 0.6832. India rupee, that should weaken some more, 71.82. South Korean won, 1189.39. Um, I think that's going to soften up. Brazilian real, 40809. Egyptian pound, 16.3317. South African rand, that should soften up now, 14.6815. Euro dollar, my target is 106, 103, 1. We're currently just above 110. I want you to go and listen to this speech of Sheikh Nima al Nima, who was crucified, I believe, or beheaded. And that speech has got subtitles because a lot of commentators simply don't understand that the oil resources in Saudi Arabia are predominantly the eastern province where the Shia, who I estimate to be 25% of the population, are in a majority. And I was speculating over the weekend that, it, that, this, that the Houthis have teamed up with the Shia in Saudi Arabia um, to achieve these drone strikes which have gone deep inside the kingdom. I was quoting Don DeLillo, there is a world inside the world, there's always more to it. This is what history consists of. It is the sum total of the things they aren't telling us. Thomas Pynchon, no matter how the official narrative of this turns out, these are the places we should be looking, not in newspapers or television, but at the margins, graffiti, uncontrolled utterances, bad dreamers who sleep in public and scream in their sleep. Um, and I was talking about the strike, we've already discussed that in, in the uh, podcast I put out yesterday, the fact that MBZ saw the writing on the wall, stop lost his Yemeni uh, adventure. Um, and then I was just mentioning this issue with the Shia and uh, the fact that, you know, I've been sort of saying that Iran was at the Hunter S. Thompsonian edge, but rather it seems to me I was mistaken. It's the Saudis that are at the edge. There is no honest way to explain it because the only people who really know where it is are the ones who have gone over. The kingdom's vulnerability is highlighted partly by military technology. Cheap, tw cheap 21st century technology can literally fly under the radar of 20th century missile and defence systems and not get picked up. 5.7 million barrels a day have lost Saudi production. Single biggest uh, disruption on record surpasses the loss of Kuwait and Iraqi supply during the Gulf War in August 1990. 
Now look at this, the price gap between Brent for delivery this November and December versus December 2020 doubled from $3.57 at the close of trade, trading Friday to more than $7 on Monday. I'd definitely be buying 2020 outright. Um, as he threatened to bomb Iran at Saudi Arabia's behest, Trump's statement that he was standing by for instructions from Saudi royals prompted furious responses. And really, it's getting absurd that Trump, the President of the United States, uh, or is he just an automaton taking instructions from the House of Saud and King, for example? And what Iran is relying on is the burden of proof that Trump and Pompeo to date are falling woefully short. And this cry wolf strategy of theirs is eroding their bona fides exponentially. Three strikes and you're out seems about the limit, in my opinion. Um, oil markets, of course, we know trade 24 hours, but it's the early hours when gremlins, wizards, and jinns stalk the exchanges. 13th of May, I said, if the US thinks Tehran will just roll over, which appears to be the case, that they're exhibiting the same deluded ideas they exhibited a day before the peacock throne got plucked. If Aramco continues to be a target of attack, some Saudi officials and advisors say the market might need a further discount of as much as $300 billion. Look, it's not going to happen. Houthi militias say other refineries and airports, Yanbi, Jizan, Riyadh, are on target. Um, uh, they reconfirm Saudi oil facilities continue be to be targets. And this is Talib picking up on the point I made as well, that Saudi oil fields, it's not just Yemen. People forget there is an oppressed Shiite minority near the Aramco headquarters, dispossessed of the oil fields, located in their ancestral area and treated like sub-citizens and they get periodically beheaded by the Saudi government. Have a look at this, Shiite cleric's execution will not end well for the Saudi monarchy, that's Nima el Nima. Gold lasted 1495.70, falling away from that key level of 1500. Emerging market currencies show that it's not all bad and that the biggest risk they face is that their central bank plays Fed without the reserve status. Super article by Poplack in Daily Maverick, Cyril Ramaphosa's moment of truth. Cyril Ramaphosa has been president for 18 long action-packed months in May following the general election. He was given a mandate to institute a sweeping program of reform. He inherited a state so broken he really didn't stand a chance. Can he pull South Africa out of this Category 5 shitstorm? On a rising tide of righteous and not-so-righteous rage and agony, Ramaphosa now stands at the moment of truth for his presidency. Nobody wanted to hear anything critical of the erudite, moneyed, silver-tongued negotiator par excellence. He would eliminate corruption in the ANC, throw his enemies in a flaming pit and toss in the torch himself. He would unleash big business and its hordes of latent capital, woo investment from abroad, restore the sheen of the Mandela and Becky era, send a man to Mars, hopefully ace Magishule with a one-way ticket, and provide an African antidote to the illiberal ethno-nationalist F-bags proliferating around the world. In short, he was a cross between Marcus Aurelius, Barack Obama, Jesus, except with premium livestock. And yet, when one peruses this resume carefully, there are warning signs. His skill as a negotiator, so important in the 1980s and 90s, has proved of little use in the postmodern ANC, which is locked in an internecine zero-sum factional war that offers no space for sensical discourse. Ramaphosa and his advisors genuinely thought that they could negotiate their way into unifying the Congress. This was a whimsically fatal notion, like a four-year-old in an Aquaman speedo leaping into the camp's bay undertow, 
hoping to commune with magical seahorses. This is societal meltdown in real time, but it really shouldn't have come as a surprise. Violence against women, black and brown expatriates are hallmarks of South African life. He was as tame as any of Zuma's so-called opponents during the former president's tenure, and instead let braver men like Derek Hanacom and Pravin Gordon do the fighting in the trenches. He was quiet during the life SED many crisis. He said nothing after the Kandla scandal, and he was, however you read things, at least partly complicit in the Marikana massacre, about which he has spoken very little. Subsequently, no one has mistaken him for a polit political street brawler, and within the ruling party he appears to inspire neither fear nor respect. According to the polls, he is, nominally, rather popular on the streets, but he has no constituency, and unlike Zuma, who knows how to engender loyalty, no one owes Ramaphosa a damn thing. It's toggled from a faux populist leader who destroyed the country for at least a generation to a plutocrat who purchased the party under the proviso that he could reform it from within. Like most of his peers, he belongs not to the people of his country but to a tiny sect of global plutocrats who have an inviolable baseline belief system, liberal free market economies, gently regulated, can grow infinitely while providing boundless opportunities for their people. Cyril Ramaphosa has better start taking his job seriously. He needs to crack heads at Lufuli House, get vicious with his enemies blocking the reform process, and go to war with the corruption clogging up the police. His reform program needs to get nasty because the patriarchal scum within his party view women as chattel and foreign nationals as sacrificial offerings to the mob. He needs to light a very large fire under his own ass, or his advisers need to do it for him. Ask anyone in his circle and they'll swear that Cyril is the smartest man in the room. But that's not the same as being the cleverest. Ramaphosa's first 18 months have been a pathetic wash. What comes next? I got it wrong. 19th of February, I said, you want to be limit long, Cyril Ramaphosa. He previously quoted Ben Okri, we dream of a new politics that will renew the world. Under their weary, suspicious gaze, there's always a new way, a better way that's not been tried before. South African all shares up 9.7% year to date. Dollar versus Rand, I expect the Rand to soften, 14.6844. Egyptian pound 16.3795, Egyptian EGX30 up 14.84% year to date, I think best performing stock exchange in Africa. Nigeria down 12.27% year to date, Ghana stock exchange down 10.58% year to date. Rwanda grew 12.2% year over year in the second quarter. Impressive, but large base effects are in play as the economy contracted in the second quarter of 2018, according to my seasonal adjustment of the figures, said Mark Bowden. Noah Gentler, until last month, the Israeli ambassador to Kenya, said the government has been taken over by barons and cartels. Don't I know? Nothing moves unless the barons are part of it. They are everywhere. In the history of Israel, he said, no government-to-government -government project has ever failed. The discussions about flights from Tel Aviv have taken a painstaking five years. Nothing has happened. But in Rwanda, President Kagame got hold of the idea. And within six months, we had a deal. I take you back to an article I wrote, Purging the Rottenness Out of the System. I said it puts an enormous premium on nimble policy making and a heavy discount on policy making that cannot read the signs. Going back to the ambassador in Kenya, nothing moves fast. The government people are never in a hurry. And that took me to Lao Tzu. Men are born soft and supple. Dead, they are stiff and hard. Plants are born tender and pliant. Dead, they are brittle and dry. Thus, whoever is stiff and inflexible is a disciple of death. Whoever is soft and yielding is a disciple of life. The hard and the stiff will be broken. 
the soft and the supple will prevail. Nearly 90% of the 1.6 billion share accounts of the CDSC have not been actively trading in the past two years. That took me back to Monty Python, the dead parrot sketch. The total size of the online Kenny gig economy as of 2019 is $109 million and employing 36,573 gig workers, according to Mercy Corps via Frank Hook. Now, Roby All shares up 2.69%, and the Edison 20 is down 13.77% year to date. Thank you for the stock of